welcome to Transparent with Tina. I am Tina Marks, your host. Today, we have a multi-talented guest with us. He is the Chief Revenue Officer of Soul Community Planet, a holistic hospitality company. He's a number one bestseller author of his book, The Remote Revolution. He's lived and worked on five continents and 15 countries. And if that's not enough, He's founded a digital marketing company that has produced more than $200 million in annual revenue for his clients. Please welcome John Elston. Hey, John. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Wow, I that was, was a lot to get out of my mouth. I mean, <laughs> you are, maybe. Not... You're... <laughs> you're way too kind. Huh? See, this, and this, you're way too kind. In this pandemic, we just don't get any compliments anymore. And so I'm sitting here. You think I'm blushing because of the fire and it was all those... Great accolades. Thank uh, you so much. Yeah. No, I am truly impressed. Seriously. I oh, mean, gosh. we we don't have that long of a period of time and I hope we get to everything. Well, I'm gonna make sure that we get to everything, okay? Let's talk about what what you want to talk about. I'm I'm well, ready. Thank you. Everybody likes to always start off in the beginning because you know this show <laughs> is about entrepreneurs, how they found their passion, how they got to where they where they are, and you know, my of all of our viewers, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there and go, I don't even know where to begin. I don't know what my passion is. And then once they find their passion, you know, one foot in front of the other. And you know, you and I had conversations. Um, about how it's a lonely business being an entrepreneur. I mean, you're pushing yourself, nobody's pushing yeah. you, and it's, you know, not, not only lonely, but it's like you have to make your own task list, yes. right? And if you've never done it, how do you do that, right? Right. Okay, that's, so you. That's okay. great, that's actually how I, I got sucked into following you and watching you was you did an episode on uh, time blocking, and uh, it's something that has formidably changed um, some of my, not disabilities, but downswings and ability to get a lot done. And, and so that's one of the ways that I found you originally was, was through Now I'm blushing. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, but it does, it works, doesn't it? And especially for the entrepreneur, right? It does. And it's like anything else, you have to be consistent. Um, you have to put some effort into it. You have to be ready to dedicate yourself to even your time blocking. Um, but when you do that, it's it's amazing. Your to-do lists go away. Um, exactly. And I know this isn't about time blocking, but I'm telling you, uh, I'm gonna lead into probably some of that in some of these conversations we're having. Good, I love it because I was on the phone with a client today and she didn't have as great of a week. And she said, I gotta be honest with you, I wasn't time blocking. The week before when I was, it was working. And now, you know, her numbers weren't as well, or weren't yeah. as good. So, okay, let's start at the beginning. You, okay. you started off as a, a bellhop or a bellman? <laughs> a bellman, <laughs> yeah, I did, right. I don't think they use that term anymore anymore. <laughs> but um, And you worked your way up to be a partner in one of the country's largest hotel companies. I did, I did. It, uh, it So many things you hear about overnight successes, no matter what profession and um, how successful people get, they have a tendency to lock on to that short last chapter um, and parallel you into success or or fame or whatever your your hobby has turned into a profession. And um, mine wasn't that way. <laughs> I started when I was 18 uh, years old while I was um, finishing up high school, entering into uh, my first college. And uh, I took a bellman's job at the invite of a, of a good friend. And uh, I never looked back. I think I'm truly blessed and one of the luckiest people in the world to get into something, one that I was very natural for and had a lot of innate abilities. Um, but then to get with the right company that gave me incredible opportunity at such a young age, I never looked back. So here I find myself significantly older than 18 and I'm still doing it. You still so, look 18. Yeah. Hey, well, thank you. <laughs> hey, listen, so, so are you saying, you said a friend of yours helped you get the job. Were you interested in the hospitality business or was it just like, I, I have to take a job? No, I have to. T I have to take a job. I was um, working in a grocery store, which was super great, and kind of had moved through the grocery store aspect of it. And something, something grabbed me. I I'll be honest, you know, thinking back, it was probably the tips. It was probably the gratuities. Um, but at the end of the day, it was, uh, you know, it was it was fancy pants syndrome. I I wanted to, to, you know, work somewhere other than a grocery store, and I was put in a really nice hotel with the opportunity to engage with all types of different people and um, work my butt off. And so I think it was trying to get into something I had always been aspiring to even 
as a younger kid from a business perspective. Okay, so and how long did it take you to get to be partner in the company? Ah, great question. I think I was 35 when I when I finally had uh, stepped up and accepted an opportunity with um, a small group of extremely talented, very smart individuals, um, most of which had more experience than me, um, invited me to join their company and not as a partner. Um, I came in in a period of about a year and a half, feeling myself around and, and trying to, you know, figure out where I should best land with this company before I made partner. Um, and, uh, you know, it was uh, it was a heck of a ride. We, we did that for um, almost five years before we took the company public. And um, then one, myself and one other individual, my, my right hand and left hand partner, I guess I was his right and left hand, um, stayed on for an additional five years and ran the public company um, as we grew the portfolio and worked through some tumultuous times and other setbacks and recessions and things. And it was, uh, it was just an incredible experience. But um, the day that ended, literally that day, I started my own business. Um, and you know, with a large hotel company, it is entrepreneurial, but it's at the end of the day, still wasn't my business. Yeah. Um, I was part of managing a public company and working for a lot of people. So the next day, I, the day my contract had ended, I started my marketing agency. And okay, so let me ask you that, because a lot of people have always dreamed of being their own boss, being an entrepreneur, but being that long, in the corporate world, working for somebody else, right? Yep. yep. Did you have fear? Did you have uh, like, <laughs> no, like, no, no, I had no fear. And that, <laughs> <laughs> that was probably part of the problem is I had no fear. I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, so I had no fear. I walked away from a very, very large compensation package and the routine and the luxuries that come with a high end corporate job and proceeded to step into my own company where I didn't take a salary for two and a half years. Um, I made a lot of sacrifices, I made a lot of mistakes, and um, grew the company. Now, ironically, the, the timing was very similar to, to today's timing, Tina. It was um, 2010, arguably what was then the world's worst economy, and I was leaving a protected corporate job. So, uh, no, I wasn't scared. I was probably a little bit more on the scale of the stupid or silly side for going to do that, um, but yeah, I did it. What 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 yeah. made you do that? I mean, was it like I want to get out from underneath? I want to be my own boss. I want to try something new. This is really exciting to me. Um, you know, because that's a lot to give up. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was, and it was a lot of sacrifice um, for everybody around me to throw me into that environment to throw myself into the environment where it was a startup, starting with myself and um, slowly, one employee, two employee, three. I think what made me start it, to be completely honest, was I had been learning this business and I had been founding this business while I was getting paid these high bucks, being a corporate officer um, of a company, I was learning where there was opportunity mm. inside this. And I think what, at the end of the day, I, I kind of scratched my own itch and said, I have something that um, other hoteliers need and brands and non-brands and luxury and limited serve could all use this digital service because um, you know people people were saying, they weren't even thinking about TikTok, so they weren't worried about pronouncing that. You know, they were saying Twitter. I we need to learn about Twitter. No, it's Twitter. <laughs> Facebook was just being born like a year before. Um, and that was an opportunity to digitize hotels to build responsive websites on mobile devices and do all of these things that I had learned um, in my corporate job and was uh, managing. So you just took it to the next natural level for you? For me, absolutely. And like I said, scratched my itch and said, I have, a, a, I, I think I can fix some problems and, um, you know, make life easier for some hoteliers. And you know, so, I want to bring up something right here, John, because I think you're a perfect example of how one should live. And what I mean by that is, you know, I think a lot of people, they get into a career or line of work and they put themselves in a box and that's just kind of it. Instead of saying, I'm going to take this, I'm going to learn what I can from this, and then I'm going to go on to the next level and the next level because we're, you know, I believe we should be constantly moving forward and evolving as human beings. Okay. That staves off 
any kind of boredom, okay? Because if you're doing the same thing over and over and over every day, I think this is a lot of the reason people are bored and they're un unfulfilled and, and they don't feel any kind of reward in their life and they just live for the weekend and, you know, Monday through Friday, they're just they're just existing. They're not really engaging in life anymore. So I think that that's really an important thing that um, that needs to come out on this interview. And that's you know one of the things that I push for, and that's one of the reasons I'm an entrepreneur because I don't want any ceiling on me, whether it's financial or what I can learn or cannot learn. Because a lot of companies that you're working for, they don't really want you. I remember when I was. Um, my sister had said early on when I was younger, she said, don't be too good of a secretary because they'll never promote you. <laughs> they'll never, if you're bad, they'll probably promote you to the next level, right? That's, that's, that, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I yeah. think getting aligned with the right, whether it's a partner, um, whether it's an investor or whether it's an employer, getting aligned with that. And that's usually what takes people, I think, a lot of time is yeah. getting that alignment right. And, um, you know, then getting appreciated. And then you get to this tipping point to where before you didn't have enough experience, now you have too much experience and you're out looking for an employer. And I know we talked um, just briefly, but I know you have a son who's getting ready to embark on, you know, manhood and future life and all that kind of great stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's hard as a parent too, because you've been through it and you know that you got to get him aligned, but you can't push him, but you got to get him aligned in at least the right direction and give him a little nudge. Absolutely. I mean, I said to him, yeah. I don't care what it is that you do. Well, it might be certain things I don't really know what I'm doing, but really is you find your passion and run with it, but just do yeah. something because, you know, especially in this day and age with, with um, teenagers, you know, there are a lot of them are just falling through the cracks. Um, college yeah. is becoming less and less for a lot of kids. They don't want to pay for the student loans if it's not paid for them already or if they don't have a scholarship. So, I mean, I get it. And college is not for everyone unless you really kind of know what you're going to be in for. Yep, you know, they say that the average millennial now is not going to be able to afford to even buy a house. So yeah. when you when you started on your own, John, did you start absolutely by yourself or with one other person? I started by myself with the team in mind. So I was and, and remain have always been very optimistic and believe that I try to take calculated risks um, when it comes to business. And so I had a team in mind and I'd had side conversations um, with individuals, but no, I, I started by myself. And um, like I said, it, uh, it, it, was, it was a tough couple of years because the, the recession was in full play in 2010. But I will tell you what saved my business from the beginning to the end was the access to human capital. And had I have started that business to what access to human capital, so okay. people, uh, teams, okay. and and people that I could get, because um, had I started the business two years before in a thriving economy, I wouldn't have been able to afford anybody, and I would have run out of of capital. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't have surrounded myself with lack of with with more skilled people in positions and 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 uh, expertise than I had, and if I would have started it. Two years after that, I would have spent all of my money that I had in reserve to live off of nothing because there was a recession going on. So there were, it, I don't recommend, you know, leaving a great job and starting something in the middle of the pandemic, but there are a lot of people who don't have great jobs right now or something that doesn't motivate them or they're just searching. And now is a really great time to do some things with teams because there's great talent again and incredible people available. So. I started by myself and I grew really quickly um, and finished, you know, maximized out at about 20 or 25 employees at one time. Okay. Um, and are, are you still involved with the digital marketing now? Um, I am in my life as the chief revenue officer at Soul Community Planet. Mm -hmm. um, I have maintained a couple accounts with my marketing company and um, have either sold off or moved out of the deliverables of the rest after 10 years. Um, but I have I have kept a couple to take care of financial responsibilities and to um, just keep my skills up. You know, I, I spent a good part of last week doing active website building and editing and copywriting and things, which I wouldn't be able to jump right back in had I not have kept the skill up with my company. Exactly. Well, which leads us into Soul Community Planet. Yes. I was I was on the website today. We've talked about it. I mean, it is 
so impressive. It is, it, well, soul is for your soul. Community yeah. is for being kind of the community. And then the planet you use, well, you tell us, you, you use No, you, you nailed it. Um, soul is really valued around wellness. Mm -hmm. um, community is really about kindness and being kind. And the planet is sustainability. And together you have soul community planet. And there are a lot of layers in between there that, um, you know, make life better for those that are involved in the company and for those that um, get to partake in staying and working and living and getting fit and well at, at one of our properties. So. I love it. You know, you and I talked about that. I mean, there's so few places that are like that, that are built around that. Were you brought into that or yeah. were you one of the creatives of that? It's really cool, this, this story, and I'll make it very fast, but I was fortunate enough um, to be brought into it. And I had had conversations, and when I say brought into it, um, by somebody I have worked with, the, the founder of the company, from my original hotel days, and back to that hotel partnership. So it goes to show that, you know, a lot of people are, and, and this is a bit cliche, but, um, you know, it's the first part of your life, it's about what you know, and then the second part of your life, I think that next chapter is kind of who you know, and keeping those relationships. And I know we're going to maybe visit a little bit about um, transparency and authenticity, but you know, practicing that from a young age let's for go, anybody. Let's go. Let's talk about that right now. I mean, okay, I love it. Go ahead. We just fell into it, and you know, that's well, my show, and and it's interesting because my question on the questionnaire, and you were very astute with your answer. I said, "How do you practice, or do you authenticity and?" and uh transparency and you said well they are two different things you know authenticity yeah. is is being honest but transparent is it authenticity is sharing what you want to share transparency is the willingness to share anything like totally that that's right and and i think you know for me i have i have really three levels of transparency when i when it comes to business for me it's and it's very easy it's low it's medium and it's high and um, on high mode is where I eke a lot of authenticity. And I think the reason those two words often get crossed and confused is because they both lead back, as we know, to the primary um, factor of trust, right? So transparency builds trust, authenticity builds trust, and um, there are times to use transparencies, I believe, in three different levels. Uh, I did it actually all in one call today using three levels of transparency and it just comes natural now you know low transparency for me would be hey we had a good month and that's transparent we had a good month the medium transparency would be um we had a profitable month and we made a 35 percent margin so you can see the transparency goes a little bit deeper you're still saying the same thing and then lastly it would be where i believe it really moves into that authentic self and being who you are you are explaining how you did that. You're explaining that we had a 35% profitability because of team members that we added this month mm -hmm. that have a tremendous amount of experience, great relationships. The interview process was just amazing. And they're already in their seat, looking out for the betterment of our guests and the culture of our company is really taking form. So that's, that's transparency okay. at the highest level. And I had the opportunity with people getting on and off the call today all they needed and all they really wanted was the low level of transparency. And that's it. We had a good month. We had mm -hmm. a good month. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Keep having more good months and good luck. <laughs> then it was, we had a great month and there was a 35% profit margin. We made 35%. And so it appeases. And if you know how to interject and use those as tools with who you're talking to, watching for body language, listening for responses, but most importantly, knowing who your audience is and what they care about. Exactly, exactly. Because yeah. then they can trust you and then you build from there. Yeah, and that's trust. That's trust. And then when you're being authentic and you're explaining that you should um, feel comfortable with this part of your business and me overseeing it because of my background and my passion for wellness or for the community. And let me tell you a couple examples of, you know, things that have happened to me in my life that really are the cornerstones for me that align with your brand. And that's authentic. I mean, it's true. I'm being true to myself, right? Yes. And I'm being true to I'm being true to the audience. And I might be selling, but I'm not selling. I'm having a conversation. 
John, but it also, let's say you didn't have a good month, all right? Uh -huh. Being transparent in that respect would probably be a little bit more difficult and a lot of people wouldn't have the courage to do that. But what I find when it's not easy for me to be transparent, whether it's something that I've done that I'm not proud of or ashamed of or whatever, it by coming forward and being transparent with it, where whether I'm sharing it with my viewers, it like it alleviates the discomfort and I'm not carrying it around it with me anymore. Does that make yeah. sense? Totally, totally, it's totally. Light on it. It's like the truth will set you free kind of. Yeah, I, I think authenticity is harder for people to exude because it is yourself. You are being more vulnerable. Um, you could be just as transparent, um, but sometimes you aren't. But sometimes being transparent then turns into authenticity when you develop trust. Uh, I don't want to go back too far, but I will tell you, I got a good example of that watching one of your shows um, when you had Dr. Amanda on there. Ooh. Dr. Amanda, you recently interviewed, uh -huh. and she comes straight out and says, hey, I had an affair, I screwed things up, I'm no good, I was, you know, blah, on and on. And um, she was being very authentic, and, and I was leaning in, yeah. and people lean in. She exactly. could have just said, I got a divorce. But she didn't. She went into that authenticity mode, and that's why she is an incredible coach. Right, exactly. And that's what makes us connect more as human beings. I mean, I connect a lot more with somebody that would, would say something like that right up front. Because the world, honestly, is filled with people that say what you want to hear, right? And then who ends up hurt in the end? The person that's on the other end receiving that and believing them. And then, you know, then there's that fine line of, do you become untrusting? Because so many people do that. Or do you still yeah. trust and continue to get burned? I mean, this is something that's a whole nother show, but it yeah. does go around and around in my, in my I, mind. I think you have to draw the line, at least I do, when there's the potential of hurting somebody else mm -hmm. um, that isn't involved in that one-on-one -on -one conversation or to a, an art, audience like your group. Mm -hmm. And I think um, you do the same thing in business. You um, try to protect feelings, but you ultimately know that it's your responsibility to be transparent. Mm -hmm. And in today's times, we're all learning more and more um, how to deliver bad news. Right. And if you have these tools in your toolkit of having these three or four levels of transparency, it's a lot easier to deliver bad news. You just gotta decide which one you're going to use. Exactly. Um, and the same thing with authenticity, you can, we've all been, you know, listening to people who you, they had you at hello, but they wanted to go five more chapters in and uh, we're polite and most of the time we listen. Right. Um, and so I try not to do that, but yeah. sometimes I get passionate about something and yeah. excited and I just go on. <laughs> like this right now. Yeah, I love it, I love it. <laughs> so um, I don't know if we want to go back to Soul Community Planet, but um, it's an amazing opportunity for me and I have only been doing engaged with this startup company um, for a little over six months um, but it's it's my sweet spot and my partners in the company are people I have worked with and we are we are just ready to start taking care of some people and reopen our businesses and uh, give them a nice nice, safe, healthy place to come and get work done and, and all of that. And they can find all your locations under soulcommunityplanet.com. That's the website. You've got great reviews on there. Thank you. So let's go into your book. Ah, yeah, okay. Let's go into the remote revolution, which is so timely. I remember when I first found you, I'm like, right. I write this book in like last <laughs> month. <laughs> right. Oh, you did. So I wrote the book in 2017. And um, a lot of people told me it was too early, although the book did very well right after I released it. It was still, a, the remote word was um, still a, a new word for most. And you lived, okay, so you lived in five co continents and 15 countries within what amount of time? Well, I, I cheat a little bit. In one spurt of 20 months, I lived on four continents. So okay. under two years, I lived on four continents. Um, and I had done work prior to becoming a remote um, in Asia, um, business trips and living there, going in, coming out. Um, so Asia was officially the fifth, but I didn't, 
I don't talk about that in the book because it was a different time of my life. But in the bio and in the explanation to you, I, I included five continents because that's I have lived and worked in those. See, look how genuine and transparent and <laughs> <laughs> see, wow. I could have I could have I went, <laughs> okay, four, not five. You sucked me in. I was gonna go low transparency and you took me right to the high. <laughs> Can't get any, can't get away with anything with me, huh? Okay, so, so is that, did you start writing the book while you were, how, how did the book come about? Great question. The book came about um, because I had met so many people abroad, many of whom I was intentionally traveling with. Um, most of them, the M word, the millennials. Um, I was the oldest in the group and uh, the most experienced. Um, and that was both good and bad. But I was traveling around with this younger generation, country to country, every 35 or 40 days, we would make a planned move. And we would um, live in the same apartment buildings, we would live in the same housing track, we would get up and go to the same workplaces, and we built a community amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. And about month four, we were on our fourth country, and people that I admired, 24 year old videographers, um, 29 year old scientists, a lawyer from New Zealand, a whole range of incredible people um, were having to consider giving up on this remote life because they were having a hard time um, making ends meet. And at the same time, I had this corporate life that I'd done for so many years. And so I'd be sitting at coffee in Belgrade, Serbia, and you know, the phone would ring and it would be one of my CEO friends. and. They would say, John, I'm really looking for talent. I need somebody to film a commercial for me or that can shoot video. And I'd be sitting across from Eddie, who's 24, telling me he's probably gonna have to go home. I would say, hang on, Eddie, talk to Ken. And they would talk and Eddie would get a job and everyone was happy. I did this, Tina, like seven or eight times in a short period of time. I introduced know you said, I, I have something here. I it's incredible. And I said, again, I have to scratch this itch. I have something. And I got turned down, I think, 18 or 19 times with um, chapter summaries and different outlines. I had tried to write a book before and it didn't. I'm, I'm, I hate to say it. I'm, I do am proud that the book did so well. But, you know, I have not been a writer. I'm, I, I'm Now I can say I am and I'm a published author, but I wasn't. And so I struggled. And then finally, I found a publisher in Austin, Texas, who put me through the ringer and said, no, we're not doing it. You are all over the place, John. You're talking about 10 books at once. <laughs> Call me back when you figured out which book you want to write. That's literally how it went. Because I was just going, I got this and I got that and I want to do this. And he's like, no, this, this conversation's over. And um, I let a couple days go by and I called him back with one specific track and outline. It was the remote revolution. And uh, they picked up the book and said, hey, you got all three. You're the CEO, you know, corporate guy. You are an entrepreneur, you started your own business, and now you are so goofy, you packed everything up and sold it and put it in a suitcase, and you started moving around with 25-year-olds from country to country while you're running your business. Yeah, we wanna, we wanna do the book. <laughs> so, it took me forever, and um, I nine months later, I locked the manuscript, and with an incredible editor um, and copywriter and all the help from the publisher, the book came out four months later. So John, do you think no it doesn't matter what profession you're in, you can live remotely and make a living at it? That's a great question. There's so many people who argue that. And when I was traveling a lot and the book could come out and people, we would get on the conversation. Ev not everybody, 80% told me, oh, that's nice. I, I can't do that work. I, I'm, a, I'm a hairstylist and I would love to do it. And then we would role play sitting next to each other on the on the plane and I would give them ideas about, okay, where are you a hairstylist? Well, in San Francisco, one of the most desired places for people to go and get wellness and to get their hair done and all the stuff. This woman ended up going to the next level of actually reserving spots ahead of time, selling her book and getting people in countries that wanted to get their hair done by a stylist out of San Francisco she went and lived in like Peru or Love France. It. I don't, you know, and it just went on and on and bartenders will say the same thing. And, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, if you're a great employee, you can go get a job. 
yeah. and you can you can go and get a job somewhere. And it may not be like you know Tom Cruise in cocktails or something where he's going to go become a bartender on a beautiful island. It might be in you know Bogota, uh, Colombia. Mm -hmm. Might be in Mexico City. Exactly, but, but it'd be a perfect way because a lot of people have never been out of their own state. Yeah, it's that's true, and you can do it so affordably and. I'm a huge just proponent of it. And, and the reason was not because of me being successful at doing it, it was me watching others doing it. Mm -hmm. that, that was really the key. Me watching a lawyer from New Zealand go and work country to country and stay employed. A scientist who was into nutrition, living, you know, continued a couple of years after I did and still goes country to country. It, it, you just have to put your mind to it. And then you have to align yourself with companies or a network Mm -hmm. that endorse it yes that, that, that's really important well and as you say in the book uh, it not only benefits the employer but the employee because they for their relationships their freedom they get to experience they become more creative if yep. they're living in different places and it but the cost probably and I think if any of us look back it doesn't have to be a remote job when did you do your best work you probably did your best work when you were most inspired. Hey, when you were happy, when you, I was just going to say When that. you were most, your, people do their best work when they're inspired. Yes. And I talk about that in the book. And if traveling doesn't inspire you or being a, a worldwide citizen doesn't inspire you, um, then maybe it's not a great idea not because it's not an escape to stop working. I've never worked harder as a remote uh, than, than I did when I was in the corporate life. I've, I've had to work harder. But it also honed your craft, though. Totally. And it, and it let me, it's really strange. I've been doing it five years. People say, oh, you must, you must get a lot of great vacations. I don't take vacations because I'm working everywhere I go. And I figure out how to align myself with work and jobs that, um, you know, suit that exploration itch that I have. So you're well, still doing this? Well, I live in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, going on my third year. Yeah. Um, all of our hotels are based in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and my current clients with my marketing agency are based in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So I am definitely doing it, absolutely. But I'm sitting here today, this obviously doesn't look like Mexico. You have to make the sacrifices of um, things that, that normal, not normal people, but people with non-remote jobs yes. um, typically can't pick up and go somewhere for 18 days to help their business or someone else's. Right, exactly. I bought a one-way ticket. I left 18 days ago and I told my partners, I'm not leaving until I can become super valuable um, to all of you and to our clients. That's hard to do when, you know, you you have all that stuff going on at home. I was already prepared for that and have been doing it. So it works well for me this way. So what's next for you? Um, like today? <laughs> no. What, oh, you, I'm kidding. Yeah. What's next for what me? Well, ne up? next is next is um, the growth and scalability of Soul Community Planet. Okay. I don't think I'm going to write another book anytime soon. I've been asked about that, and I think they're like like my publisher originally said. You have ten books that you're all talking about at once. Um, but I am so all in right now to this, and there couldn't probably be a worse time to be in the hotel business. I have to be a million percent. <laughs> Oh yeah, um, well, we're getting out of that now. But so let me ask you. You know, I saw on your uh, on some of the questions that you answered, and it was what keeps you motivated. You do visualization. Yeah, I, I do. About that, because I have a morning routine that I do every day. Okay. Because my my day goes sideways. So tell us about your yeah. Life. Effective visual visualization. Um, I have been doing it. I can remember doing it and acting it out when I was six years old. Um, when I was six years old, I was got a chance to wear my first tuxedo in my aunt's wedding. And I didn't take the tuxedo off for four days. And Tuesday <laughs> came, I think it was a Thursday wedding. Tuesday came, my mom had to slip it off of me. And, but I was, you know, some people call it daydreaming. Some people will call it imagining. But when you really start to practice it throughout your whole life, it's effective visualization. Mm -hmm. And if you just take that one episode of what I was doing at six and then what I was doing at 11 when I was, you know, I was, I was wrapping my lunch pail box um, in brown butcher paper to make it look like a briefcase. I didn't want the, you know, whatever was on it at the time, uh, the cartoon characters. I, I wanted to pretend like it was a briefcase. 
So I visualized walking to and from my office as then a, an eight year old. And I just have done that my whole life. Um, I visualized writing this book and I did an outline for, you know, what is your North Star? Who is your avatar audience? Um, what is your champagne moment? Those are all visual things that you have to think about. And what is that champagne moment? Um, to me was, you know, sending the book to my kids. And that was what I was going to be my success. So I had to get through writing the book and getting it published and getting it out to get to my champagne moment. So um, you're visualize, visualizing the end result and that's what keeps you moving forward. Is that what you're yeah, saying? I'm visualizing the process too, right? Like I think a lot of athletes do this and they don't immediately put themselves on the Olympic podium. Yeah. Um, they go through three phases of you know this visualization i think i think there are more but you know the the ones that i focus on are picture and describe and it's kind of like i like to use this analogy that if you want a piece of chocolate cake and you're thinking about it um and then you stop thinking about it that desire goes away but if you close your eyes and you think about the chocolate cake and you think about the frosting and you think about you know how moist the cake is and maybe the ice cream with it you're visualizing it and you're tasting you start to right so what you're doing is you're visualizing the result hey, <laughs> okay so that's when we can all relate to us right yeah <laughs> like a puppy or something like that go ahead right. <laughs> so if you visualize that you're going to stand on the box above the new york stock exchange and watch cnbc and watch people hit that mallet every morning you know what that mallet sounds like. You know what the bell sounds like. You get to see the crowd and the people. And you don't go right there. You got to go in between over a period of time. But I do it every day. I'm not a great meditator. I can, I'm not great at clearing my mind. Um, I try, but I end up effectively visualizing instead of my mind being still, I'm thinking about how it's going to feel to open our fifth property um, to, to, to do all of those things. So I use emotional um, emotional intensity for visualizing, um, which is usually music for me. Music is a huge emotional tie for me. me so, um, you know, it depends on what I'm visualizing, but if it's something competitive before a race or before a speaking engagement, you know, these guys all, men and women have their walkout songs now, right? Like, what is their walkout song? So it might be Rocky, it might be that. It yeah. might be something. So, so true, so true, then, you wanna elevate your mood. Put on your go-to song, your victory song, right? Right, and how many people have cried during a song? Because emotionally there, it's taking them somewhere. Exactly. Where they've been. So I use that and listen to music a ton and my playlist is so erratic and crazy, but it depends on what I'm trying to focus on. Kind of like you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and now who can't use the last one, exposure? I mean, we're so sucked into technology. You can watch master classes, you can watch YouTube, you can listen to your podcast, you can listen to, you know, any of these things and apps that will give you experience. Exactly. They're gonna teach you. Exactly. So exposure to the to the passion or the idea helps in the visualization too. Awesome. So they can get your book on Amazon. Yeah. Totally on Amazon, The Remote Revolution, or under John Elston in the search. Um, I have it on uh, an ebook, so it's in the Kindle store. Mm -hmm. It's on Amazon, and um, that's where my exclusive arrangement is at the moment. Okay. Um, yeah. Perfect. It's, it's an easy read. It's 178 pages. I really wrote it for you know a few friends at the time. I didn't write it for a large audience, and it ended up working out. I wrote it for a smaller group. So there's pictures. Um, and it's a it's a weekend read amazing Thank well you. you're amazing you're so interesting i could talk to you for hours okay. and i will not on the show thank anymore you. but <laughs> such a pleasure having you on and thank you thank so you. much thank you thanks for finding me and then being open to this i i i mean it sincerely i'm sucked into your work and the people that you have on and i am now in your audience oh, so thank, thank you. you i really appreciate that john thank you well, thank you. Thank you for tuning in. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, it's Tina Marks TV. And you can always visit my website, transparentwithtina.com. We'll see you next week. Thank you. I'm in the